Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to my June 2020 wrap-up. So I've got two books to talk to you about. So the first is The Fifth Elephant by Terry Pratchett. So this is one of his City Watch books, featuring Sam Vimes, etc, etc. He's actually sent on like a diplomatic mission to Überwald, but at the same time, a crime has occurred in Ang Warpork, so he's kind of... You know, trying to investigate this crime at a distance as well. Um, luckily, he can use the clacks, which are like a semaphore tower setup that's new to the disc world. Um, but yeah, it's funny because it, there's a lot of comparisons drawn between like diplomacy and being a city watchman. And um, I mean, Vimes is like my favourite Discworld character, really, anyway. So this has always been one of my favourites to the point at which I'm re listening to it and I know bits of it, like not almost off by heart, you know, and like little lines I remember. And like there are things that I think I might have stolen from my own writing. So there's a reference to Sam Vimes, he's an ex-alcoholic and he keeps a bottle of whiskey in his drawer just as a reminder. And I realised I stole that for James Lightfold. But yeah, really enjoyed it. Probably, i got to give it a 5 out of 5 to be honest. Absolutely cracking read and a pleasure to reread it and would recommend full review coming soon. And then I read The Bridge by Ian Banks. So this is uh, like a sort of a thrillery, dystopian sci-fi novel. It's actually funny because I was reading it at about the same time that I read Snow that I watched Snowpiercer, and I've read the graphic novels of that, and there are definitely some similarities here um, in terms of this sort of dystopian thing. I mean, The Bridge could very well, the, the, you know, The Bridge is just a train that doesn't move, basically. Um, there's also some, I mean, I don't normally like it when a character has amnesia and that's used as a plot device, but it's actually used really well here to the point at which I found it quite enjoyable. And there's a minor character as well who's going for therapy. He thinks that he's a different piece of furniture every day and he has to have like a regular police guard with him because sometimes he thinks he's a women's B-day and he could be quite insistent. So yeah, I mean, overall, I'd probably give it like a 3.5 out of 5. I've been saying 3.25 out of 5. And the reason for that is there are some bits in Scott's dialect, and I don't like the way that Banks writes Scott's dialect. Um, like, I enjoy reading it when it's Irving Welsh, so it's just a very different style of attacking it, I suppose. To the point at which quite often he was coming out with these things, and I'm like, that, that's what people in the Midlands say. Like, he doesn't sound Scottish, he sounds like a brummy to me at times. Um, but yeah, the actual storyline that, that I was covering, in the end, turned out to be okay. It was a slow burn, but um, yeah, by the end, I mean, I was glad it was included. I just wish it wasn't written in that Scots dialect. I wish maybe you'd got Irvin Welsh to give him a hand with it. But yeah, overall like 3.5 out of 5 and I uh, would recommend if you're looking for something a bit weird. Like it's more about the ideas in it than the actual storyline. Alright guys, just got the one book to uh, wrap up today and that is The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. So I was chatting to... Goodness me, who was I chatting to? I can't even remember now. Uh, let's have a little look at my notifications. Uh, Spinelli Speaks. I was chatting to Spinelli Speaks and um... She's just uh, read The Old Man and the Sea, and I mentioned I'm probably about to do a reread, and she said I should. So I did, so I listened to the audiobook. There's an audiobook of it here on YouTube, uh, and it's narrated by Charlton Heston, of all people. And it's like, uh, it's only about two hours, 20 minutes long, and I le listened to it on like 1.5 times speed anyway. Uh, I, I actually probably liked it more this time than last time. Uh, it's probably like 3.75, 4 out of 5 for me. Uh, the, uh, I guess the thing is, I mean, I'm vegan. So I, I don't really like it when Hemingway writes about hunting or fishing. So that kind of puts me off like the subject matter. Um, but it, I mean, it is a good little character, stu like character study. And actually, I think there's a lot there that I hadn't appreciated previously that you can learn in the art, about the art of writing just a sort of a really good classic short form story. So um, yeah, I'm definitely glad I reread it. All right, guys, just the one book to wrap up for you today, and that is We Can Remember It For You Wholesale by Philip K. Dick. So this is volume five of his collected short stories. Weirdly, volume two of his collected short stories is also called We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. And I have read that story. Uh, there were a couple of others in this that I'd also read as well. So I'd read The Electric Ant and um, Faith of Our Fathers. I'd read that one as well. But uh, yeah, I really enjoy Dick's short stories and there's a lot of food for thought here, a lot of questions that he asks that are, you know, really get you thinking. And I plan to read all of his uh, collected short stories. There's a large lorry going past outside apparently. Uh, yeah, I did enjoy this pretty solid, probably like 4.25 out of 5. Um, I don't think there was a bad short story in it and uh, there was a really good one. I recommend just looking it up actually. Um, where is it? What's its title? It was for Harlan Ellison. Yeah, the story to end all stories for Harlan Ellison's anthology, Dangerous Visions. It's like two paragraphs long, so look that up online if you can. Now my WhatsApp's going off. So yeah, uh, would recommend, and I'm going to be reading the other four volumes in his short story collections at some point soon. Okay, the footage that follows is all from my uh, wrap-up. So 
the footage basically is going to be used for both my wrap up and for my ladybird books mini wrap up i guess uh, but obviously my monthly wrap up has all of my other books in and the ladybird one will have a, a ranking as well so this is have a go 2b and this is by w murray basically the point of these books is to teach kids to read through repetition uh, so there's actually the the information i really quite liked uh, was at the start and at the end. I'm going to read some of that uh, in a second. So, uh, W. Murray, the author of the Ladybird Keywords Reading Scheme, is an experienced headmaster, author and lecturer on the teaching of reading. He is a co-author with Jay McNally of Keywords to Literacy, a teacher's book published by the Schoolmaster Publishing Co. Limited. And so, um, it's very much like, so, you want fun, I want fun. This is fun. I don't think it is fun, mate. You've, he's catching a boot. He's fishing and he's caught a boot. This is Pat. I like Pat. Pat likes fun. We like this dog. So down here, it's teaching us, for some reason it's teaching us Pat. Why is it teaching us Pat? Okay, that's really odd that it's teaching us Pat because if you look at um, what it's about here, it says, uh, some of the words in the English language are used much more frequently than others. These words, which are, these words which appear more frequently can be called keywords. Research shows that 12 of these keywords make up one quarter of all those we read and write. 100 of them form half and 300 about three quarters of the total number of words found in juvenile reading. Reading skill is accelerated if these important words are learned early and in a pleasant way. You're not telling me that Pat is one of the 300 most common words in the English language, especially because it's capitalised, as in like, Postman Pat. But yeah, and then at the end we have a list of words used in this book. Total number of new words, 27. And again, it says now use book 2C. So you're actually meant to read 2A first, and that introduces the words, and then 2B kind of repeats them. So we've got number of new words in this book, 27. All the 16 words from book 1B are also included. Average repetition per word, 9. Capital letters new to this book in order of appearance, W Y W L C S N. It's got like inverted commas that are not introduced at this early stage of reading. They are brought into use in book 4B. I just think it's fascinating how much like attention to detail they've gone into there. And like that, those stats at the end, really cool. So I gave this a 4 out of 5. I just thought it was... Uh, like, it's a nice idea and I think well executed, although the problem being you, you really need all of the books in the series for it to work, but then I can understand why they would do that, because from a marketing point of view, that's going to sell more books. So yeah, four out of five. So here we have a ladybird learning to read book telling the time, and somebody, the previous owner, has helpfully scrawled eight o'clock here, and they're correct. So kudos to that. Um, pretty basic book, and it, the premises it goes through like a day in the life of a child I guess so you know at eight o'clock we have our breakfast some of them I disagreed with slightly <laughs> well some of them are very specific as well at 12 o'clock mummy cooks the dinner no she doesn't she cooks lunch at one o'clock we have our dinner no you don't you have your lunch at four o'clock we have our tea I mean I guess actually they are having tea like afternoon tea as opposed to dinner you know um but well, like where are some of the specific ones like where was the uh, boat one i think it was at three o'clock at three o'clock we sail our boats quite specific um but yeah i can see why this would be useful if you were learning to tell the time uh, i mean 3.5 out of 5 for what it is this one was by me gag by the way here we have Mr. Noah's Animals, the monkeys and the foxes, and so this is part of a series, the Mr. Noah's Animals series. There's a little story, it's actually two stories in one. Um, obviously it's biblical and, and Bible inspired, which I mean I'm not exactly religious so I, I didn't particularly care for that side. But Also we have this bit here, Mr. Noah went to look and he saw the two snakes. The snakes were like a rope, the monkey went up and down to get the water. I'm not convinced that two snakes could support the weight of a monkey carrying a bucket of water but maybe I'm wrong I don't know we'd have to carry out some experiments and then I got really obsessed with this one with these I don't know if you can see them these are little boys look or little um oh, what would you call them like life rings or whatever life preservers um and they have Noah's Ark written on them but basically the places where the where it's written change from story to story here we have a little title page for the foxes I like the color of this um, so yeah, look, now the, now the writing has changed position, and in fact, I believe, yeah, if you compare the two pictures, it's in this, <laughs> it changes from frame to frame, and then here we have in this bottom one, one of them is missing the apostrophe, and the other one does have the apostrophe, but it's written on the water instead of on the, the buoyancy ring, 
But uh, yeah, I did enjoy this one. Probably like a 3.75 out of 5. It would have been a 4 out of 5 if not for the religious-y stuff. But then how would you write a Noah's Ark story without it being religious? Um, I guess if they'd found some other way to do it that didn't have those religious undertones to it and just had this information and this kind of quality of writing and illustration, uh, it probably would have been a 4 for me. This one is Learning with Mother, the Ladybird Under 5 series. And this is written by Ethel and Harry Wingfield. And um, this one's strange because it's, it's written specifically for parents as well. Uh, so it's quite dense in places. So for example, here we have um, a guide to joining the library. And they say in this, um, school at five may be much too late for an effective introduction to books, which I agree with. I was reading like way before we went to school. And then I remember that at school, they made us learn the alphabet as A, B, K, D. And I already knew it as A, B, C, D. And they said the way I'd learned it was wrong. So I had to relearn the alphabet and then relearn the original alphabet that I'd first learned. It was, uh, anyway. So we have this bit on dressing up here. I'm going to read this section out. Probably mother and father will be drawn into the pretense. They should, of course, play along with it. For in this way, children prove and exercise their power of original thought, their main tool for learning and progress. At this age, fact and fancy may be equally real to a child, and it would be wise to be a little permissive about this. It is usually an indication of the struggle between the enormous world of reality surging in on them and their own private world of fantasy to which they turn for relief and satisfaction. We think out our problems, children play them out. Here we have a section on building up and using bricks and this reads so much like an advert. And also this company is named after H.G. Wells strangely, but li listen to this. The satisfying solidarity of the wood, the ease of construction, the adaptability to other tools such as model cars or animals, all these challenge creativity. A collapse just means that the bricks can be built into something new, unlike so much of the flimsy mechanical gadgetry at present offered for sale and which some childish mishap mobilises for good. Shown in the illustration are the H.G. Wells bricks sold by Paul and Marjorie Abbott Limited of 74 Wigmore Street, London, W1. It also, I don't know, I kind of, uh, I miss those days when all the companies were limited companies, you know, run by families. Uh, it was simpler times. There's a van outside. Here you have some instructions on making homemade play scales. These instructions are insane. You will need one wooden coat hanger with metal hook removed, one empty cardboard cylinder about 12 inches to 15 inches long, two identical empty plastic cartons, two equal pieces of string about 14 inches long, one three inch nail or a little longer than the width of a cylinder, a five or six inch circle of stout paper, a gimlet, <laughs> there wasn't he in the fellowship of the ring, several weighty pebbles, one hair grip and sellotape. And then we have learning to sew here. And, and this, I think, is a really good tip. Give a child some old greeting cards, a fairly big nail, a hammer. Or maybe maybe don't give a child a hammer. And an undersurface of thick card or a piece of wood to work on. And let her or him first punch the holes. Uh, I think more what I thought was a good idea is where they say card is the best material for the first sewing lesson. Small hands find sewing on flimsy cloth so difficult that this skill is often needlessly left unmastered until school age. I don't know, man. I... I, I still can't really sew. I can only just sew. Well, I sewed my guitar strap and it took me an hour. J took half an hour of just trying to get the thread through the needle. Anyway, Learning With Mother, uh, book number four in this series. I gave that one like a 3.5 out of 5. I thought it was, again, it was good for what it is. Here we have a Ladybird fourth picture book. And the idea here is it can show you some pictures and teach you some stuff. And uh, you can, you can you know, learn to read and learn about stuff at the same time. I did think it was funny that one of them is Potatoes. A picture book with potatoes in uh, and we've got talking about potatoes and I just feel like they could have said to boil and mash them stick them in a stew but obviously this predates Lord of the Rings didn't it uh, umbrella talking about an umbrella this little girl has her umbrella up so she will not get wet in the rain she will stay dry what color is your mother's umbrella I have no idea what color my mum's umbrella is in fact when I saw this it reminded me I've got a messenger and ask her I'm gonna ask her just out of the blue and see what she says and um, mirror Talking about a mirror, what do you see when you look into your mirror? Disappointment and broken dreams. Uh, so yeah, this one probably more 3.25, 3.5 out of 5 maybe. Uh, there's not that much to it. I mean, obviously it's a picture book. I do like the idea that it comes with these little prompts though, so that you can discuss things with your kids, you know? Okay, so then we have Tassel Tip Plays Truant. And uh, there are a few of these Tassel Tip stories. Um, I really like this actually. I like the way this map is done. Um, so, you know, you quite often get maps in stories, but the way the places are labelled, it's not like these are the fields, it's like uh, they gathered flowers here. This is the hill they whizzed down. I just thought that was a nice little uh, addition. Story by Sarah Cotton. Now, I'm not actually 
a particular fan of like fairy tale style stories this kind of does have that it has a range of different animals um and this kind of does that sort of thing it has a range of different animals that all go to school together and they decide to play truant and uh, this follows what happens when they do that um and then the teacher finds them in the in the forest and i'm like well why wasn't the teacher at school i guess maybe he was looking at them it's not really clear how much time passed <laughs> But uh, yeah, I actually quite enjoyed this one. I thought I thought gave this one like a four out of five. I think the storytelling, uh, the way it was written, and the images all came together really well, just to make a nice little children's book, you know. Then we have learning with traditional rhymes, dancing rhymes. Now, unfortunately, this this is part of a series that includes finger rhymes, number rhymes, memory rhymes, talking rhymes, action rhymes, and dancing rhymes. I'm not really one for um, dancing rhymes or action rhymes really like the memory rhyme sounds interesting because it's always like you know remember remember the 5th of november and all these mnemonics and stuff but uh yeah it's cool because it's got like the uh sheet music for them as well so i'm going to give you this example here did you ever see a lassie did you ever see a lassie a lassie a lassie did you ever see a lassie go this way and that go this way and that way and this way and that way did you ever see a lassie go this way and that it's got uh, verse one one child performs an action in center of ring whilst other children watch Verse 2, everyone imitates her action. The word laddie can be substituted for lassie throughout this rhyme. Uh, you got you, you put your left arm out, which is actually the hokey gokey. And the lyrics to this are different to the ones I know as well. You put your left arm out, your left arm in. Left arm out and shake it all about. You do the cokey cokey and turn around. That's what it's all about. I'll do the cokey cokey. I'll do the cokey cokey. I'll do the cokey cokey. Knees bend, arm stretch, rah, rah, rah. You put your right arm out, your right arm in, etc. I'll do the cokey cokey, etc. You put your left leg out, etc. I'll do the cokey cokey, etc. Fair enough. And yeah, here we have the other one. So this is the one that I like the sound of. Memory Rhymes, book three. A diverse collection of rhymes mainly concerned with days of the week, months of the year, points of the compass and letters of the alphabet. With these, a child learns simple progressions in an amusing and absorbing manner. Overall, I'd probably give this one a three out of five. I think it's my least favourite of the lot. It's alright at what it does. Even then, the kind of the instructions to do the dances and stuff are... I don't know, they're difficult to follow at times, but as I say, it's, it's just not really for me that kind of uh, poetry, I guess. And finally, Fun at the Farm, 4B. So again, uh, this is kind of a higher level than like, uh, level 2, lower than level 5. We have a danger sign in this. Look, danger, says Jane. It says danger. Keep away, Peter, she says. Do not go there. And um, I just think it's interesting because danger is one of the like 300 odd words or whatever that they use repeatedly throughout this. But that one seems to me to be a really good word to teach kids as opposed to pat, for example. No one needs to know pat. And I think this is very very typical of the time we're talking about here. Daddy reads and mummy works. Yeah, he's reading the paper and she's feeding the kids. So uh, yeah, this one's like 3.75 out of 5. It was alright. Alright, so I've got three books to update you on today. So the first is Alan Bennett, A Private Function. This includes the screenplays of The Old Crowd, A Private Function, Prick Up Your Ears, 102 Boulevard Houseman, and The Madness of King George. I think Bennett's actually at his best when he's writing dialogue. And so because these are the forms of screenplays and plays, they, um, they really work out quite well, you know. They really capture his voice quite a lot. Uh, I'm a big fan of Bennett's, really. Uh, I haven't seen any of these movies, um, and to be honest, I think they'd probably work better as plays. I really enjoyed probably his novels more, actually, saying that. Or something like The Lady in the Van was fantastic, and uh, The Uncommon Reader. These were still very well written, though, and uh, quite a few of them have got some like little nods to specific uh, periods in history as well. Uh, like, there's one of them about Proust. So overall, if you're a Bennett fan, probably check it out. I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5. It was all right. Then we have Hard Times by Charles Dickens. So I actually read this as a bedtime book. Uh, I thought it started out pretty well, but quickly became quite dull and boring. Also, this edition, it's got tiny print. So when you're trying to read it just before bed, it was quite hard to focus. So I think I probably would have got more out of it just if they'd increased the font size a bit more, even though that would have meant making it a thicker book, you know? Um, but Dickens does characters very well, and he asks a lot of like, you know, sort of societal questions here. Uh, there are also some great one-liners, which I wasn't expecting to. But overall, um, yeah, it did drag, and it was nowhere near as like gripping for me as, say, um, um, uh, Oliver Twist was, or um, A Christmas Carol was great as well. David Copperfield wasn't as good as that, either of those, but it was a lot better than this. Uh, it's not a bad novel, it's just it was a bit of a struggle to get through, and... Um, yeah, I could see, like, I had somebody say to me, like, oh, we had to read it for required reading at school, and it's haunted me ever since because of how difficult it was. And I can imagine that, like, it wasn't really a pleasurable read. Um, it was certainly one that I had to think a lot about. Um, and I don't know if I'm going to spend that amount of time thinking. Like, for example, at the moment, you know, a lot of people talking about Black Lives Matter, and I'm kind of like, 
If I'm going to spend this amount of time thinking about something, I'd rather read about, you know, uh, societal racism or something like that rather than, you know, 19th century working class life, which which doesn't really seem as relevant anymore. But hey, -ho, I gave it like a 2.5 out of 5. I mean, I base quite a lot of my ratings on enjoyment and that's certainly true here. But I don't let that put you off if you have been meaning to get to it. It's, it's, it is what it is. The Positronic Man by Isaac Asimov and Robert Silverberg. So I believe this is actually based on a Bicentennial Man as well. But fortunately, I c couldn't really remember the plot of that going into this. Basically, uh, this is a robot novel and it follows a man called, what's his name, Andrew James? Andrew Martin. I knew it was another name for the surname. And um, yeah, this robot basically slowly becomes more and more human or at least more and more of a person and there's a big distinction there yeah i really enjoyed the questions it asked in here of the reader in terms of a lot of questions about what it is to make someone human and that kind of thing and also what asimov does great is he sets up his laws of robotics and then he breaks them or at least bends them and uh, i always think that's a pleasure to behold the way he does it so uh, really enjoy this one probably a 4.25 maybe even 4.5 out of 5 and a uh, full review coming soon all right, you just got the couple of books to update you on today. So the first is a so the first is a million little pieces by James Frey. This is basically a, n a non-fiction drug memoir. At least I assume it's non-fiction because it gets called a novel. So nobody's really clarified that to me. Um, but yeah, it's about a guy going th called James Frey <laughs> going through rehab uh, and go through a rehab facility, a facility for drug and alcohol addiction. I really enjoy drug books and this was no different. I just find it really fascinating to read about. Having said that, I would say this was about 100 pages too long. It's a bit of an old chunker. Um, and after a while, it just starts to get a bit repetitive because the same thing just keeps happening, you know. And all the way throughout, all, the, all his thought process is just like, I'm so depressed, I need drugs. I'm so depressed, I need drugs. Granted, it's very realistic, but it gets a, a bit repetitive after a while, I guess. Overall, I gave it a 4 out of 5. As I say, I think if it had been a little bit shorter, I would have enjoyed it that little bit more and maybe even given it a 4.5 out of 5. It is a good drug book, but it is not the best drug book. Okay, then I read um, A Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. So I read this via audiobook, via a version I uh, found on YouTube. And uh, yeah, I've read this years ago and um, recently read some other Huxley and I was chatting to somebody on Booktube and I just happened to say like, oh, I'm probably about due a reread of Brave New World. And we got chatting and I thought, well, why not? So I did. Um, I, I thought it held up really well. Uh, I probably gave it like 4.5 out of 5. It's oddly prescient. It gave me a lot of the vibes that I got when I was reading Stephen King during the coronavirus pandemic. Sorry, I'll stop you from getting blinded. But then I'm in ca casting shadow. Oh, no. So uh, yeah, it was it was an interesting read, and um, I'd forgotten most of the plot to be honest. I remembered a lot of the general ideas and things like Soma, um, and you know, Praise Ford and all this stuff. But um, I've I'd forgotten a lot of the specific plot, so it was good to go back and reread that. So yeah, four point five out of five. And then I read an indie book by a booktuber, so I guess I read this for Tarden Danes, indie read-along, although I didn't specifically go out of my way to do that. This is Life After Dane by Edward Lorne, uh, our very own E here on booktube. He's a big Stephen King fan and he does some really great Stephen King theorist videos. Has been recently been doing like his top Stephen King books. And uh, yeah, he's got a whole bunch of books out and actually I need to read some more of them. But obviously this one I picked up first because... Dane is my name. And uh, Dane Rivers was the, I think he was called the truck stop dentist. He was a serial killer and uh, he's been put to death. And then the book is written from the perspective of his mother as she starts to see stranger and stranger things happening. Doesn't she, Biggie? Does she see all kinds of weird shit? Yeah, she does. So, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this one. I thought, I don't much like the cover. I'll be honest about that. Um, but the actual writing itself, fantastic, uh, hold, holds up its own against like traditionally published stuff. And also the interior layout is great. Uh, you can tell that it's been, you know, well edited as well, well proofread. Even the text is justified. So yeah, I was very happy with this one. Um, I was given a, this as a uh, gift as well, a birthday gift, because it was on my uh, bookish wish list, wish list. And I shall definitely be adding the rest of these books on here now. So yeah, Life After Dane, I gave this a pretty solid four point. Five out of five, yeah, it's one of the probably one of the best supernatural thrillers I've read. All right, guys, just the one book to wrap up today, and that is Van West: The Past by Kenneth Thomas. This is an indie book. Uh, full disclosure: I was sent this for review, and uh, they also compensated me for an hour of my time with my hourly rate in exchange for me reading and reviewing it. Basically, that doesn't really change my feelings, though. And actually, 
I'm very selective with the books that I um, do take on for review these days. So I picked this up because it sounded interesting and it didn't disappoint in that sense. I would say it's um, a kind of a YA sci-fi novel but with elements of a lot of other different genres. So uh, because it's Van West The Past, this being book one, The Past, um, it's kind of almost historical fiction at times. Someone basically goes back through time to the formation of CERN in Paris. Um, so that was cool as well because I'm really interested in France and French culture. Towards the start there was like a Hunger Games sort of vibe thing going on or like a Harry Potter Triwizard tournament. Um, there were a few issues with the formatting and some of the sentences I thought were a little bit weird but overall it was pretty good for an indie uh, novel. I'd probably be generous and give this a 3.75 out of 5 or maybe maybe just 3.5 out of 5. It's somewhere between the two. Uh, I thought it was very competently done and for a YA readership definitely. For me I would be interested in seeing what he could do if he wrote something a little bit grittier but um, you know such as life I suppose and actually I thought the the length was pretty good too I mean it's like just under 200 pages but for the first book in an indie series in particular um, you know I don't think it would have held my attention if it had been twice as long I, I think it was as long as it needed to be so yeah overall did enjoy it all right guys just got the one book to wrap up for you today and that is Nightfall 2 by Isaac Asimov so this is basically it's the second part of um, a short story collection basically so it was published in hardback just as Nightfall um, but they had to split it in two to get it in paperback for some reason. So instead of having 20 stories, it's 10 stories. But they're all selected by Asimov as being some of the best of his career. And um, so, you know, you get to kind of follow Asimov's take on, on what's good. And they're also all come with introductions as well. I'm not going to lie. I think like iRobot was a better short story collection. So considering this is meant to be the best of the best, I think it's just kind of average. <laughs> Um, and I think just any random short story collection of Isaac Asimov's will give you kind of an equal amount of val uh, value. Having said that, I did still really enjoy it and just a couple of hundred pages, it only took me a couple of days. And uh, I particularly like with Asimov the way he makes me sort of question things and, and to think. So um, yeah, there was a lot of that here and a lot of like weird ethics questions and stuff. It was good stuff. And then I read Rotten Rulers by Terry Deary. So this is a horrible histories book, uh, non-fiction aimed at kids. So the only problem I had with this is at one point he made a joke about the earth being flat and it didn't necessarily come off as being a joke. So I'm just worried that kids will read that and take it seriously and think that the world is actually flat. It also then made me doubt some of the other stuff because for example he was talking about this um, sultan who in about 900 AD he had 117,000 books and he had them all carried around everywhere he went by a horde of camels that had been trained to walk in alphabetical order. That sounds awesome, but now he's gone up. Now he said that the world's flat. I'm like, well, maybe that other fact is bullshit as well, you know? So that's a shame. But overall, if you want to learn about some of the various nasty people who've been in charge throughout years, which uh, I think is arguably more relevant now than it ever has been before, then now uh, worth checking it out. I give it like a 3.75. All right, guys, just the one book to wrap up for you today, and that is By Jupiter and Other Stories by Isaac Asimov, the grand master of science fiction himself. There are 20 stories in this. They all come with their own little short introductions and also outros as well. I mean, that's kind of one of the problems for me because this entire book is, I think, 240 pages. So, you know, it's not very long for a short story collection with 20 short stories in especially when you bear in mind that each of those stories has an intro and outro as well we're talking 10 pages per story max really um, and I think Asimov can usually do with more time than that just to um, you know to explore the themes that he has in mind for each story so uh, I don't know because of that I think it could have been better I'm not saying it was bad it just could have been better really um, yeah, I gave it like a 3.75 out of 5. Um, Asimov's short story collections are usually my jam, but this one wasn't particularly good, I didn't think. Um, still glad I read it, because I want to eventually read everything that he ever wrote. But um, yeah, certainly wasn't my favourite. And um, probably one more for the, the hardcore fans and for the average readers. Alright guys, so I've got the one book to update you on today, and that is Dark Nights and Dingy Castles by Terry Deary. This is a Horrible Histories book. It's actually a Horrible History special. I've always enjoyed the horrible history stories ever since I was a kid and I've also always been fascinated by castles. So perhaps it's no surprise that I did enjoy this book. I'd probably give it a pretty solid 4 out of 5 and I think if you're interested in castles it's definitely one worth picking up. A lot of jokes in it, a lot of uh, sort of more childish sense of humour. There, um, there's plenty of information in this. I will say that the last one of these ones that I read, um, the Rotten Rulers or whatever it was, um, there's more stuff that I remember from that. So for example I still remember 
uh, the, the Grand Vizier guy who had 117,000 books carried on camels alphabetically. Whereas from this book, I can't actually tell you any specific bit of trivia that I picked up and internalised. But I did find it interesting to read and there's lots of cool stuff about people like, you know, Richard the Lionheart. There's stuff about the Crusades. And um, I think the tagline of Horrible Histories is like, history with the gory bits left in. And they certainly do that here. Um, which is no bad thing, you know. It, it doesn't let history be one-sided, which I think has always been a risk in the past, especially with British history. <laughs> so we'll start with the two He-Man books. Um, and I'm going to review these as one because they're essentially the same. So we've got uh, He-Man and the Lost Dragon and He-Man Meets the Beast. And uh, they're both by, what's his name, John Smart? John Proud? John Grant, I was close enough. I missed He-Man the first time around, so I never really was part of the, the He-Man fan base or anything like that. So it's kind of been cool to experience them like this, really. Um, I have enjoyed them. I would probably give them both a pretty solid four out of five and they're like cute little books for collectors I would say for sure. So that's those two. All right, then we have Bedtime Rhymes. So this is, I think, compiled and illustrated. Yeah, so chosen by Ron Randall or possibly Ronnie Randall, I don't know. Illustrated by Peter Stevenson. And um, yeah, these are really cute. There are a few here that I particularly like. So these are all like little, just little rhymes that are designed for you to read to kids at bed. Uh, bedtime. So here we have up the wooden hill to Bedfordshire, which is a phrase I've heard before. My mum used to say that. But then apparently the next line is down sheet lane to blanket fair. Um, you know, and we've got like hush little baby, don't say a word. Papa's gonna buy you a mockingbird. Uh, hush your bye baby on the treetop. <laughs> See, this is the thing is that it, it's not very clear. Like it's got this rhymes in the book thing at the introduction, but it goes from one rhyme to another, and sometimes it's difficult to realise when multiple pages go together, I guess. So it reads like a one long serialised poem of all these other poems put together. But that is kind of cool because you could read this whole thing to a kid in bed for 10 minutes, you know, and they'd fall asleep. So for its purpose, it's pretty good. For me, actually a 3.5 out of 5. Um, the last Ladybird book, because these are all Ladybird books, and the last one of these that I read, I read it earlier this month, it was in this wrap up, the, um, the Dancing Rhymes. And that was disappointing because I don't dance. Um, but yeah, I do sleep, so I could relate to this, even though I'm not a child. And then we have a Dennis the Menace, A Splashing Time. This doesn't even have like an author credited, it's just a, a Ladybird Books thing. Obviously, I assume that they got permission from uh, the Beano to do it. Um, I mean, it's clearly like the original Beano, yeah, that's published, uh, published by Ladybird Books. Why did I just see DC Thompson? Oh, text and illustration is DC Thompson and Co Limited. So DC Thompson actually used to be a client of mine. We used to do some pay-per-click advertising for them. But they're um, uh, like a, uh, they publish loads of different specialist newspapers and magazines and whatnot, and they own the Beano. So that's quite cool. It like it is obviously illustrated and written as well. Because I thought maybe Ladybird might have written it, and uh, they might have just got Beano to illustrate it. But no, it'd be, it'd be like the original team working on it. I mean. To be fair, I've just opened this up straight away and we've got Take That Red Skin. I mean, it hasn't aged well. And um, we've got this thing of like throughout all the Dennis the Menace things, I guess, of Walter the Softy. So in here he's being a softy because he's using feminine hygiene project products. I made that sound like he's using tampons. Um, he was using, uh, what does it say here? His lovely flower fragrance bath soap. Hmm, sounds nice. So yeah. Uh, 3.75 out of 5 for this one, purely really because of the uh, nostalgia factor. Alright, another couple more that I've read. So I read Return to Neverland, Peter Pan. Um, I actually feel like the story in this I've read before, so I must, because I've read Peter Pan by J.M. Barry, but I'm guessing that I've also read whatever J.M. Barry this novel this is based on. This doesn't come with an author listed or whatever, but it was quite good. Um, it was nice to go back to the world of Peter Pan. I would say this is probably, for me, it's like a 3.75 out of 5, but if you're really into Peter Pan, you're obviously going to gonna love this. And then we have Treasure Island. So this is retold by Joyce Faraday. Um, what's interesting about this is that I've read Treasure Island. I've read it a few times, actually, and I don't really like it. I love the story and actually really like Muppet Treasure Island. I just don't like Treasure Island. And so I think it's something to do with Stevenson's writing style. And I had the same thing here, where I really enjoyed the story, but because it wasn't written by Stevenson. So this one, this one for me has got to be a 4.25 out of 5. And um, honestly, if you're interested in Treasure Island, maybe read this. Um, it was a, uh, you know, 
or I would at least get it on an audio book. But yeah, not really a Stevenson fan, unfortunately. But this this was cracking. All right, so I've got two more books to update you on. So the first one of these is House of Weeds, poetry by Amy Charlotte Keane, illustrated by Jack Warlington. And as by Fly on the Wall Press, I was sent this copy here. Uh, let's read this. Uh, the, the gimmick here, I say gimmick, you know. It's all illustrated, which is all very cool. And um, it's all based on, like, um, you, you're going to help me, Biggie. It's all based on different flowers and stuff. So this poem's called po Polypodium Vulgari. Uh, fern. As a youth, you'd never wish to be the creep, that shady character. The moment you realise I am him, you twig and lift, black stalks outgrowing. It smacks you like a heavy spade, your childhood essentially decimated. Yet you creep further to the dullest, harshest corners and thrive there. It's a shame, but own it. Perhaps it was predestined, like an astrologer's surprise birthday buffet. I mean, someone has to be me. How would the rest of you feel normal? So yeah, I quite enjoyed this, probably like a 3.75 out of 5. I particularly enjoyed the illustrations and, um, you know, the flowery theme. I thought that was very cool. And um, yeah, I, uh, I, I've i really enjoyed, to be honest, everything that uh, Fly on the Wall Press has sent me. This one's interesting because I didn't initially enjoy it that much. And then um, once I got stuck into it, I really started to enjoy it, you know. And then we have Self-Portrait by Elizabeth Horam, which is basically uh, poetry based on the life of Frida Kahlo, which is very cool. And um, yeah, the interesting thing about this is quite a bit of it is written in Spanish, but then the author does very kindly provide us with the English translations as well. And um, yeah, it was an interesting one to read. I enjoyed the poems. I've read Elizabeth Horan stuff before. Um, she's previously written a book called Alcoholic Betty, which was about her struggles with alcohol abuse. And so I imagine she kind of um, sort of sees a lot of herself in Frida Kahlo, I guess, with a lot of Kahlo's struggles. So again, probably another 3.75, maybe even a 4 out of 5 with this one. So, I read, oh, I read two books. I finished reading If It Bleeds by Stephen King's. So this is four novellas. And guys, I'm very sorry, I didn't really think much of this one. Uh, I, I haven't seen any, well, I hadn't seen anybody's reviews until after I read it. I have since seen some because I've been on Goodreads to put my review on there. And for example, uh, Edward Lorne really enjoyed it. And I think I see why, because three of these four stories are just Stephen King... Well, actually, okay. Let me go through them story by story. So, we have Mr. Harrigan's phone. Uh... <laughs> Jesus Christ! What? <laughs> anyway. So, Mr. Harrigan's phone uh, is very much King trying to be old school Stephen King, which I love old, sc old school King, don't get me wrong, but I also love new school King, and I'm not one of those fans who thinks that he was only ever good in like the 70s and 80s, so I just don't really like to see him try to recover old ground, I guess. Um, so yeah, and this is about like a guy, uh, a guy gets buried with his phone basically, and then somebody else is ringing his phone. He, 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 the the uh, bit at the end where he talks about what inspired him to write it was more interesting than the story itself really. It wasn't bad though, that was probably the second best of the bunch for me. Um, then we have If It Bleeds, which is the Holly Gibney story, and um, the entirety of the blurb on the back is dedicated to that, except this blurb takes you up to two pages before the end, we don't actually see it in the story, and it's super misleading anyway, because by the time all of this stuff happens, another character knows that all of this stuff is completely irrelevant anyway. So, I put in my review, it's like somebody writing a blurb for Star Wars that doesn't talk about the Death Star or the Rebellion, but does say there's going to be a really good Ewok dance party on Endor. It's just like, it's, it's off the mark for what's in here, and yeah, it just annoyed me. But the story itself was pretty good, even though I don't really like King... When, I don't like King doing supernatural uh, elements as part of crime novels, just because I think... I don't think it tends to work with, like, gritty crime novels. Um, it works, like, a, a lot better with things like fantasy, or just, like, in a real-life setting, I guess, but I think as soon as you... It's because I read a lot of crime novels, you know? So, it just... I don't know. I like it if crime's going to use the supernatural, it should be supernatural in the style of, like, um, uh, The Hound of the Baskervilles, where, spoiler alert, there were, what's going on with people? Spoiler alert, there was no s demonic hound. Well, there was, but it wasn't actually a demon, you know? Anyway, <laughs> then we have The Life of Chuck, which is a three-act story told in reverse, which I feel as though he basically only wrote as an intellectual exercise. 
Uh, I have nothing to say about that. <laughs> and then we have Rat, which is again him trying to be old school, old school Stephen King. It even focuses on a writer. It even uses rat imagery, which is very old school King as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think the way I see it, he had If It Bleeds, and he worked on that thinking it was going to be a longer story, and it wasn't. He told all the story in the time it needed, and but he wanted to release it because it goes well with the Holly Gibney books and whatnot. So then I think he just bundled in three other random like old ones from his desk or whatever that they probably were written recently you know but they're just not good really um so like i saw uh, e i think said this is like one of his best novella collections and i think he's mad there is no way you can compare the you can compare the four stories in this to the four in uh, different seasons like you've got shawshank redemption the body uh what else have you got uh, apt pupil which is one of my favorites of his and uh the breathing method but out of those, the breathing method is the weakest story, and that's still way better than all four of these. So, and then even like I was thinking like Four Past Midnight, that wasn't particularly good for me, although I know a lot of other people do like some of the stories in it. I loved though, The Langoliers. And again, The Langoliers in that is, I'd rather have, I'd rather have The Langoliers than all four of these basically. So hey ho, you know. Uh, I gave it a 3.25 though. I mean, it, if it was any other author, it would be all right. But because it's King, it just felt substandard for me, and uh, I'd hyped it up too much as well. So when I finally got to it, it just was a bit of a disappointment, unfortunately. And then I read Ireland by Terry Deary. Uh, this is another horrible histories book. I gave this one a 4.25 out of 5, purely for the fact that I learned a lot of new and interesting stuff that I wasn't previously aware of. I was actually talking to my mum about it before I started reading and saying neither of us really knew too much about Irish history. All we really knew about was the potato famine. Um, and the troubles, um, you know, between the Protestants and the Catholics. And it does go into both of those, but then it covers a lot of other stuff. Like, I, re I enjoyed learning about, like, Viking rule in, the, in, in, in Ireland and stuff. I even learned things like the fact uh, that the phrase beyond the pale comes from Ireland because there was, uh, the pale was like an area of Dublin. So basically people from beyond the pale were the uncivilised folk who lived away from the city. I imagine it's very colonialist British to actually use that phrase, really. Because I am, if you think about it, who's going to... Oh, you, you're just taking the piss now. Probably the same person. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it was it was interesting to read it, even though I think he is also British as well. So maybe I'd like to read about Ireland from an Irish author. But um, I'd like something, any recommendations you guys have got actually would be good. Because I'd like something more mid-level, more like high school level. Like I don't want something super dense, university level kind of big deep history of Ireland but I want something a bit deeper than this preferably written by an Irish author let me know in the comments if you've got any suggestions I've read Learner's Ecology um, and this is by Anita Ganeri some basic ecology stuff in here really I'm um, talking about things like you know how the environment works what we can do to help protect the environment all of that good stuff um, I thought it was quite a good little introduction for kids some of the stats in it, it makes me wonder when it's printed because it says like oh we might run out of uh, you know fish in the ocean well we should run out of fish in the ocean by 2050 from what I understand and um, yeah there were just some little facts here and there that made me wonder when it was published and how accurate those stats are um, probably is quite a recent one I guess so yeah, I gave that one like a 3.5 out of 5. Sorry, Biggie. And then we have these uh, Young Discovery books. These are both by Priscilla Hannaford. So first off, we have Dinosaur Lives. And then we have Sea Animals. So I'm going to give Dinosaur Lives a 3.75 out of 5 because dinosaurs, everyone likes dinosaurs, you know. Um, pretty fascinating stuff in here. The information all seemed relevant. Uh, these also come with little glossaries at the end as well, so they highlight certain words. So for example here we have fossil, the remains of a plant or animal from millions of years ago preserved in stone. Um, so yeah, 3.75 for that one and then 3.5 out of 5 for sea animals. Sea life's not really ever been my thing for whatever reason, but um, you know, I am still still glad I read it. I have two little scooby doobers to update you on. So, I don't know why I call them, well I know why I call them scooby doobers Two ladybirds, the first of them is Scooby-Doo Haunted Ski Lodge. This is by, just copyrighted to Hanna-Barbera, uh, which is strange actually because, so basically my issue with this is it's written, it, it reads as though it's been written by someone who doesn't speak English natively. Now I know the goal is probably to make it accessible to younger kids and stuff, 
but you don't do that by just making like grammar errors and like weird sentence structures and stuff so I don't know so it wasn't very good unfortunately I'd probably give this like a three out of five um, and I love Scooby-Doo and I think that's why because it was a disappointment to the Scooby-Doo franchise quite frankly uh, Scooby-Doo Haunted Ski Lodge and then we have Spine Tinglers by Ladybird uh, these are selected by some geezers well a geezer and his geezerette uh, Zenka and Ian Woodward chose it and it's illustrated by Chris Ruddle no, Chris Russell of Hurlston Design. And it's basically a bunch of different... It's almost like Halloween poetry from the old masters. So there's like Shakespeare in here, E. Cummings, I think Wordsworth's in here. Lots of different poems, but I marked out this one that I really quite like. Um, this, for me, is easily the highlight of the collection. Sorry about that. Uh, we've got this tower here as well. I'm going to read this one out to you. This is by Michael Rosen, Emma Rosen Books' his dad. I don't think he is, but he might be, I don't know. <laughs> a long time ago. A long time ago, there was a man who lived round our way, and he said, when I die, I don't want to be buried in the ground. I want to be buried in the air. So he set about making sure he would be buried in the air. He got people to build him a big yellow tower. He said, I want to be buried halfway up this tower. Not long after, he died. When they came to bury him, they decided that they didn't want to bury him in the air, halfway up the tower. So they buried him in the ground instead and there was nothing on earth he could do about it. But the tower's still there, and everyone knows it was built for the man who wanted to be buried in the air, but couldn't make sure he would be. I don't know, I, I can't tell you what it is I love about that. I mean, I think it's possibly the simplicity of the language. It's quite dark as well. It's like, a, you know, one of the darker ones in this collection, I think. Um, I don't know, it's just one of those ones that makes you think, and it feels quite, it's got like quite a classical feel while still feeling quite modern too, so, yeah, that was cool. Alright guys, just the one book to wrap up for you today, and that is Hearts in Atlantis by Stephen King. I read the hardback, the dust jacket's over there somewhere. I overall thought it was alright, uh, I mean I'm trying to tick off all of the uh, King books that I have unread, and um, this one in particular uh, I wanted to watch because the movie's now out on Netflix. I read uh, If It Bleeds when I travelled to Tamworth recently, and then read, started reading this on the way back. Read it over the space of three or four days maybe. It was alright, I liked the, the way the different stories were interlinked. Uh, I like the fact that it was all kind of commentating on the Vietnam War, some more subtly than others. And uh, overall, it was alright. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. It's not his best collection by any means, but um, yeah, it was fine. It was fine. And I'm glad I finally got to it after all these years. I've had this for about five years. Hello! Okay, I have uh, th three or four books to update you on. I'm not sure whether I mentioned, but I, I, fin I read uh, Hearts in Atlantis by Stephen King. I gave that like a 3.5 out of 5. Pretty good uh, short story slash novella collection. It's basically two novellas and three short stories is how I would call it. And I actually watched the movie of that last night as well. Uh, yeah, it was like 3.5 out of 5. It was okay. A full review coming soon. Uh, then I reread what I talk about when I talk about Running by Haruki Murakami. So I listened to it via audiobook. It was only like four and a half hours or something. So I pretty much went through it in one go. I had to stop halfway through actually to go to a meeting. But um, yeah, I didn't enjoy it as much as my first listen through uh, my first read through of it so my first time I think I gave it like a 4.5 or a 5 and had it as one of my top books of the quarter I still thought it was good but not as good as I'd found it the first time but um it's kind of relevant because the first time I read it I was just quitting smoking and now I'm just quitting smoking <laughs> so um yeah because he talks about when he was about 33 at the time and he quit smoking he was smoking 60 a day I am at 31 and I was smoking close to 30 a day so you know, no excuse Anyway, then I also uh, read these Ladybirds books. So I read Ladybird Dinosaurs, which I gave a 3.5 out of 5 to. Uh, the coolest thing in this is that, let me show you. It's got some illustrations of the dinosaurs next to people for scale, which I thought was quite cool. Uh, we have jokes, jokes, jokes. Uh, I'll read you a couple of these. My problem with these is that they were like super cliche kiddies jokes, basically. They weren't very funny. Um, what is the quickest way to count cows? Use a calculator. Some of them are just facts as well. How did Noah manage in the dark? He turned on the floodlights. What's long and green and always points to the north? A magnetic cucumber. It is cool though, because they got like kids from schools to write in with these, um, but I would give it like a 3.25 out of five. And then we have Ladybird Spelling and Grammar. For this one, I'm gonna give it a 4.5 out of five, I reckon. It's, there's actually some pretty interesting stuff in here in terms of like, um, I don't know, word origins here. So we have like words that originated in Greek, Latin, French, uh, miscellaneous ones. So uh, khaki comes from Urdu, for example, meaning dust. 
that was cool. Silent letters, types of sentences, how to use apostrophes and stuff. This would be good for both, both for kids, but also for people who speak English as a second language. And actually for me, it was a decent little refresher and I'm a fucking writer for God's sake. So yeah, really good, 4.5 out of five. And that pretty much brings us to the end of this month. It has been a busy reading month for sure. As always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.